Hey everybody, welcome to Coffee Time at the Water's Edge. I'm Rodney and I'd like to thank you for joining us. We are going to another throwback episode, but this time it's not going to be from the old Q&A episodes. This one is coming from But What Does the Bible Say? My old podcast that I had with my wonderful co-host from back then, Tim. And uh, we had Dr. Stephen Roby on to discuss how to study the Bible. I think this is a great episode for all of you who may be new to the faith and are not real sure what to do with that big giant Bible that's sitting in front of you. So let's go ahead and start digging in. Hey everybody, welcome to But What Does the Bible Say? I'm Rodney and I am here with the wonderful Tim Parsons as my co-host. I like that tag. And we have a special guest, Steve Roby, who actually we've discussed earlier was <laughs> has been on this show now as many times as you have. <laughs> so there's been a guest and a host at this point. <laughs> it's fuzzy. This is the sequel for both of us. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Round two. All right, so today we are going to discuss about how we should study and read the Bible. Now, Steve, we brought you on here because we thought this would be a good, good place to bring in some pastoral advice on this subject. And so to start this off, I'm going to ask you the, this, this question. Pretend I'm a new believer and I come up to you and I'm like, okay, I got this. Now, what do I do with it? <laughs> Yeah, I think I'm going to I'm going to always encourage new believers on the why of studying the Bible, about the importance of making that a, a daily practice, like a regular part of your life. And as I was thinking about the why, it is there there's so many reasons why I think believers should read the Bible regularly, daily. Right. You know, Jesus himself when he was tempted in the wilderness, he's tempted, he says turn these these stones and the bread. And he says, man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So it is nourishment for us. It is our bread. It's our daily bread. Um, second Timothy three sixteen. you know, the, all of scripture is God breathed. It's inspired by God. It's useful. It says for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and for training in righteousness. All of those things are a critical part of growing in your faith, being taught well, being rebuked and, and corrected, right? So if, if you lack the That's humility right. to be corrected, you probably lack the humility that it takes to follow Jesus. Hmm. And so it's a, it's a prerequisite to being a Christian is to humble ourselves before him and his word and its authority and for training in righteousness, right? So we, we want to be trained and changed by this book. We believe it does have the power to change us. And Romans 12 says... Be do not be conformed to the power. Do not conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Well, how does God do that? Hmm. Through His Word, That's right? right here. He uses that to teach us, to correct us, to to train us in righteousness. And and honestly, when I when I was gifted my first Bible, which I have here with us, like two of the first verses I memorized come from Psalm one nineteen. And if you're not familiar with that Psalm, I think there's 176 verses. Every single one of them, minus maybe three, are reference God's word right. or his precepts or his commands in some capacity. It is an ode to God's word. Mm. And one nineteen one hundred five in the cover page of this Bible that I have here says, your word is a lamp to my feet. It's a light to my path. And so for a new believer, it's like, this is what's going to guide you in your faith life. It, everything in here, you have all that you need in here that is sufficient for faith and practice. And this is to be read, to be studied, to be lived out in the context of community of believers. And so I, I, I'm always going to push that why. And from, uh, the other verses that I memorized right off the bat was from that same Psalm, Psalm 119, um, verse 9. That was the one that, that hit me because I came to faith at 22 and I had lived a very sinful life. Yeah. And it says, how can a young man keep his way pure? Hmm. By living according to your word. And then two verses later, I've hidden your word in my heart so that I might not sin against you. So I'm going to encourage a new believer why you should study it, because this is your guiding light. You know, this is this is how you're going to know God, not in a subjective, just trying to interpret your experiences and make up a God after your own fashion, which people tend to do. Right. But to know the true God as he has revealed himself in his word. And uh, so that I think that's a starting point, understanding why you need to make mm -hmm. it a daily practice. 
Um, but as far as reading it, uh, I'm going to tell them to get a study Bible. I'm going to tell them to 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 not do what I did and read Revelation first. <laughs> I jumped right to the end. Wow. But, um, but no, I, I, I encourage new believers to to read John. Um, start with the Gospel of John. I think the temptation is to get a plan and start in Genesis and try to read it cover to cover. I don't tell people to do that. No. I would encourage people to to, to know Jesus because if you're coming and asking that question, you've you've probably just responded to the gospel not very long before that. And the the good news is good news about Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. So I'm going to start there. Then once you learn more about Jesus, study the New Testament. The Old Testament's going to be so much more readily, you know, accessible and understandable in light of all of the fulfillments we see in the New Testament. Right. Because what's people get lost. They start reading in Genesis, by the time they get to all the genealogies, you know, yeah. by the, it's usually Genesis, Exodus, they get to Leviticus. That's when people start bowing out, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I tell people to read the New Testament first. Now, see, I, I I think I was told to read Genesis, Exodus, and then go to the book of John, hmm. I think is the way I was told originally. Interesting. But that wasn't there again. That wasn't until like two years after I'd already been a Christian that mm-hmm. somebody came to me and said that because my first Bible, I think I tried to go straight through, like you said, and it's just not not a good way to go. Yeah, very very few people are successful in, in doing that. Um, and so I, there's not a right answer. There's not a, a perfect way to, to, to shape that. But if, if, if I'm writing a plan, I would say start in John, then read Acts. You know, that's the kind of history of what happened after the resurrection with the early mm-hmm. church. Then Romans, which you have a systematic presentation of the gospel. That's, that's when you're starting to get into theological language, terminology, starting to understand the gospel in theological ways. Um, and Because John and Acts, you see the gospel lived out in experiential ways. You get mm-hmm, to Romans yeah. and you're getting the theology. Um, and then the epistles, right? And at some point you, you go back and then you read the Old Testament. Mm. And I, I think reading, not getting hung up too much early on on trying to understand everything you read, but reading for flow. Like I remember right. as an early believer... By the time I got to the Old Testament, I remember sitting down and reading Job, which is a lengthy book on a bus ride across Germany, like the whole book of Job, <laughs> um, because I just wanted to read it for flow, right? And so there's a there's a certain familiarity I wanted to gain with the Bible. And so just not getting hung up on having to understand everything, reading it through, um, getting the flow of it. And then right. there's, there's a difference between reading it that way and then r- studying, um, which there's you know, some tips and practices, I think, for new believers to learn how to study as well. You're right. Yeah. Tim? <laughs> <laughs> you know, what, based just what you're saying, I mean, I think that's that was helpful for me was starting in the God, you know, in John is where people told me to start as well. And that is good because it is it is tricky because, like you said, if you start in the Old Testament, there's no, there's not really a guide that says, like, this is how this all applies. You're just kind of, if, if you don't have the context, you know, I mean, you are just kind of, you kind of get lost, yeah. I, yeah, I, I, I think now we have, we have so many tools now, though. It's yeah, it's not necessarily a bad idea, right? Any any time you're in the Word, it's a good idea. Yeah, <laughs> and so now I encourage people to use uh, the Bible Project. So the Bible Project has little introduction videos to every book, and when they do the Old Testament, they specifically demonstrate how what what allusions to Christ, right. what what shadows of Christ what prefigurations of Christ, types of Christ we're going to see in that book of the Old Testament. And I, th- I find that to be very, very helpful because all of Scripture points to Christ. He himself said that right on the road to Emmaus. And so gaining that understanding of how these Old Testament books point to Christ is is critical. And you can miss that if you don't have right the resources and tools early on. Right. You find yourself getting lost in the... <laughs> really, in the genealogies yeah. and the offerings and the different types of sacrifices and yeah. all the laws. I, I know that um, one of the things that I know when we started doing our course seminars on the Old Testament, uh, one of the things that actually helped me to see um, was to always look towards the the uh, um, the way we look at the history of the old te- or the Old Testament and how it actually points to Christ. Yeah, absolutely. I think, so I think for me, that was a, that was a good learning thing for me also. And I think when we start reading the old Testament, if we start looking for that, as we read, we start seeing it a lot more and you, it just, it just kind of 
makes it more uh, exciting, I think, in reading the Old Testament. So, Well, I guess a question that I was kind of thinking about, but I didn't... Uh, um, what, how do you feel about um, reading plans that are more chronological at some point? I mean, or, or is it better just to, to read the Bible in the, in the order that it's in? I think understanding chronology is important. Yeah. I don't think you necessarily have to read it chronologically. Mm-hmm. Um, some people find that. That's what I'm saying. There's, there's no right or wrong yeah. way. If you're reading the Word, it's a good thing. Um, what I found for, for me, what I found very helpful early on is I have a—the first Bible I read was this one here. It's a, it's a Quest study Bible. It was the NIV. It was what was gifted to me right after I came to faith. And it anticipates questions that new believers might have. So it's kind of designed that way. So as I'm reading the text, I can look in the margins and say, oh, that's a question that I was thinking of. Mm. They put it right there, and then here's how they responded to that. Mm-hmm. So I found that really helpful. But most helpful in any study Bible, you're going to find maps. You're going to find timelines. You're going to find critical you know, information that helps you assimilate you know, all, the, all that you're taking in. And so that helps with chronology to understand you know, as Isaiah's prophesying, well, this was the time during when Hezekiah was king, and I just mm. read about him in, in right. Kings today, you know, as I'm, as I'm in my own reading plan. So now, I think after a couple of years, um, I got into a rhythm of just doing cover to cover. Like, I read Genesis 2, Revelation every year, and I mix a psalm in it in the evening. So I have a, a daily psalm. I usually read through the psalms twice um, throughout the year. Yeah. And now I know that... Um... I think one of the things that really um, helps, especially for me, especially with the the epistles, and for those that are new, the epistles, we're talking about the letters that were, were written by the apostles. Um, for me, I think a, a big help was also understanding the historical context of what was going on, not just in the city of that church, but when you when you get a little bit more into what was going on within the church in that city— um, it, it helps you kind of understand why Paul or Peter is writing a letter to those people, and it, it brings more. I think it does bring more context to us uh, when we when we understand what was going on. That it's not just the letter. That there's a reason why they wrote those letters. You know. So yeah, and the epistles are didactic, so they're they're specifically teaching or correcting the church and the problems that they had early on. So I find those extremely helpful. All the all the pastoral epistles. Because, you know, you think about the Gospels, it's, it's primarily narrative, um, acts, narrative. Romans begin, that's when I, I think, that's when a lot of the didactic teaching starts in the New Testament. And, and all of the epistles are written, you know, geared at issues that really we still face in the churches today oh, yeah. <laughs> um, in different ways, different <laughs> theological controversies, different, you know, maybe not different sins, probably a lot of the same <laughs> sins that they were faced with, but... I find those to be very instructive, very helpful. But what you're saying, any any study Bible worth its weight, you know, and salt is like it's going to have an introduction. You mentioned this last week. It's going to have right. some sort of introductory information about the author, about the dating of the book, and and to be honest, some of those they're they're just doing their best to understand where it fits in the f- first century hmm. you know, in the context. Right. Um, it's going to talk about the purpose of the book, any key literary themes. That general information is helpful going into it, but I think even I think even early on for like the newest believer, I'm just a big advocate of don't get too bogged down, you know, trying right. to understand everything. Just just read it. Mm-hmm. Just, if you if a verse troubles you, write it down. Mm-hmm. Like set it off to the side and come to think about it. And that's actually one of the helpful things I did early on. Not only that, but I as verses really spoke to me. Um, I had a little yellow. A, a tab of like yellow paper and I would just write them down. That's how I memorized a mm. ton of scripture is I just wrote all these like, Oh, that's, I need to memorize that. <laughs> and I had like pages. And, and when I was in Iraq, I remember going in, in Kuwait as well. I just remember reading through those daily yeah. till I memorized like a bunch of the Bible hmm. right off the bat. It was just really helpful. Um, so yeah. I think starting out, not getting too bogged down there, you just think of it as, you know, this is a this is my meal for the day. Hmm. I'm not going to overeat too early. <laughs> I got to, I got to, right. I got to, um, you know, continue to feed this appetite that I have for God's word, and and you know, hopefully expand my stomach. This we're getting fat is not a bad thing. Necessarily, like expand, 
expand my appetite. Getting fat on the word. That's yeah. right <laughs> <laughs> Some people use that, that in a bad way. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. <laughs> right. <laughs> you have to exercise it too, though. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yes. That's, really, practice. that's the balance. Yeah. <laughs> now, what do you think about, you know, as far as, and, and not just for a new believer, but for even a, a believer that's further along in his walk with Christ, uh, as far as I know, I see you brought the, the Vines uh, Expository Dictionary, and you also brought, what is that, the... Uh, it's a concordance. A concordance. So, yeah. yeah, long before Logos or crazy Bible software existed, um, there were these tools that were viewed as some of the... These, these were just real key tools to getting into more in-depth word studies and things like that. And so uh, if I'm if I'm coaching a new believer get in the word, read it for familiarity. If you're going to do more study, you know, do that at a separate time. Like have your daily reading time where you're going to have the same place. I always say the four Ps, right? Have a place, be punctual, you know, set a time where you're going to do it every day. Um, you're going to have a program, right? A plan in place for your reading. And as a part of all of that, you're going to be um, consistent with, with, you know, just being in the word daily. But as far as like studying specific topics or wanting to dig more in a certain book, I would marry that to whatever else is going on at your church, right? So if you're, if we do community groups, so like do a deep dive into First John when your church is studying that together, right? And do that on your own, right? As, as separate, and then you have you're more equipped yeah. in your community group discussions. You're more prepared on Sunday mornings to hear and receive, and so that that's all important. What I have here though is when after I'd read through the Bible, and I I had an inordinate amount of time in my life because I got deployed to Iraq and I oh, literally yeah. could do nothing but work and read or work yeah. out. By the way, this, like, this is sure. the Bible that I had on a sub, yeah, on yeah. a summary, the small <laughs> one that I had. And uh, yeah. so, yeah, you so, do. I mean, so by the time I got back to Germany, then I like, okay, I need to learn how to study the Bible. Hmm. And these are two tools that I think are critical um, just to, for beginners. These are really beginning tools. The vines is a, is a dictionary essentially. And so anytime I would come across a word in the Bible, like expiation, you know, or, or sanctification, you know, these, these words that I didn't really understand because they're theological terms, I would look them up in here hmm. and it would give me a definition. It would actually even be tied to the Strong's number, which is a right. concordance language, right? And so in a concordance, the most, com or the most celebrated one or most famous is the Strong's concordance. Right. I have one of those. This is not, this one's tied to an NIV. I have a Strong's one at home. Um, and the Strong's numbers are tied to the vines. Mm. So you see that word, you get the number for it, then you go to your concordance and look up that number, and then it'll tell you everywhere that word appears in the Bible. Right. So you just start looking in other places. How is it used in this context? How is it used in this context? And I just became a word nerd through that, <laughs> like studying. I didn't know Greek yet. I didn't know Hebrew. I hadn't right. taken formal education at that point. Um, but it got me into it, and it, it definitely expanded my appetite to study the mm. word, you know, on a deeper level than, than what I was early on, just kind of becoming familiar with the stories. Cause I had no church background. Like I didn't know about Daniel. I didn't know any of the Bible stories really <laughs> yeah, very few just, tangentially. Yeah. 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 So I wanted to just read it all yeah. first and then I started studying. Deeper. Yeah. I mean, I, I came from a, a, from a church background. So I had the, the basic stories, you know what I'm saying? From, from, you know, from, you know, from Bible you know, VBS school. Yeah, stuff, VBS, yeah. yeah. So having that stuff, yeah, I guess I, I, I mean, I had a little, I, I think about what it would be like to come in and, and not have that is just to me. Yeah, I, mean, I knew wild. Noah's Ark. Like right. I was <laughs> somewhat familiar no, with Noah's that. Ark is uh, <laughs> universal. <laughs> yeah, but I'm not sure I, I did know much yeah. and I'd maybe yeah. been to church maybe five times in my life. Yeah. I'm trying to think of what stories that I would have even been familiar with when, yeah. when I came to the faith. You know, I mean, obviously <laughs> Noah's Ark, but yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm trying to think. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, there again, though, you know, and that goes into where, you know, even though I had those stories, I mean, I didn't have Jesus, you know, so, and that wasn't until I was 28. And um, I think, I mean, I've told you before, it was Mark 4, reading the parable of the sower, yeah. which you guys just talked about in Coffee Time Q&A. And um, yeah, by the way, yeah, we're getting a slight plug there for Coffee Time. Go yeah. watch Coffee Time Q&A. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put a link down below. That's right. But, uh, but you know, I, I think about... The fact that, you know, when I, when I first started reading and having some of those basic knowledge, I think that's one of the reasons why 
Um, for me, coming to Christ, I was all I was. Now I, I've told you, I I came to Christ reading Mark four because mm-hmm. I was reading the Bible, because I was checking on the book that I was reading by <laughs> Tim LaHaye. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's, I wasn't that's a whole, say anything yeah, about that. That's a whole nother episode. <laughs> <laughs> but that'd but, be a fun one. <laughs> yeah, that would be a fun one, wouldn't it? But I think that because I was reading it already, I think that's why I went ahead and started reading from the beginning. But like like we talked about, yeah, I just got axed by the time you get through. Actually, I think I made it to numbers. Mm-hmm. And in numbers, I was like, okay, what am I doing? There's about eight consecutive chapters in numbers that, yeah. that trip people up every time. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I I tend to when I come to that in um in my yearly reading, I like fly through that. I read it <laughs> yeah. as fast as I can. Yeah. It's, it's, just, it's a list of names yeah. um, for yeah. like many, many chapters. <laughs> um, but I still pay attention to like, especially if there's any variances. Mm-hmm. Right. 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 Yeah. So I guess you kind of talking about the resources and things like that. So that helps to connect the new Testament and the old Testament a little bit. I know you mentioned, um, the, um, the time with Jesus uh, in the wilderness with the devil. I mean, all those are, Biblical references, which um, I didn't realize at first, you know, when you read through the the gospel. So I thought that was, I don't know, that's something that really stood out to me when somebody made that point that it was kind of a back and forth with the with the scriptures. I don't know. I thought that mm-hmm. was pretty cool. But um, I guess getting back to what I was asking, um, so those resources, um, that is kind of your primary connection between the Old Testament and New Testament, kind of connecting some of those words? Yeah, no. So I I think the next step then, so like yeah. step one is just reading, yeah. about making it a daily practice to read the Bible. Like you don't have to have all this. You don't have to have the software. You don't have to, you know, the Word of God is sufficient. And yeah. I believe that. Like if you didn't have all the study notes, like it is sufficient. Um, I, I do think the study stuff is helpful. And so the next step, I think, is getting into the vines, the concordance. That's helping connect scriptures mm-hmm. different places, specifically word studies, right? Mm-hmm. And so like, how, do, how does it talk about salvation everywhere in the Bible? The next step, though, I think you're getting into what would be called systematic theology. And that is understanding that all of scripture, like what does all of scripture teach about a given subject? Not just you know, the deity of Christ in the book of John, but what, what does Paul teach about the deity of Christ in all of his letters? How do we harmonize all of this? Because if we believe the Bible is all inspired by God, right? That Second Timothy 3.16 says, if it's all God breathed, then the seeming contradictions are really going to be our problems, not the word's problems, because scripture is going to interpret scripture. Scripture is going to help enlighten scripture to us so that we can see a fuller picture. And that's where, man, you start making these connections of, of how the old and the new go together, how how the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament functioned versus how it functions in the New Testament. And so systematic theology is another great way to study. Um, Wayne Grudem's written probably the most used systematic theology. It's, it's my favorite one. I have several. Um, but almost all of them have a similar approach. You start with re- the topic of revelation, right? general revelation, special revelation, which is the revealed scriptures. You start with God. You know, what is the doctrine of God? What is God like? What are his characteristics? What does the Bible teach us about God? Then you start with Christ, the the person of Christ, the work of Christ, the atonement, you know. Then you start with the Holy Spirit. Then you talk about heaven and hell, sin, the doctrine of man. So all of these different doctrines, a systematic theology book helps you look at what does all of scripture teach about a given subject? And that's when you're getting into, I think, refining your theology, what you really believe um, all of scripture to teach about something. And that way that helps. So the reason I'm a big advocate of systematic theologies is because it prevents us from taking some isolated verses and building Mm. a whole framework of theology Mm. around it or doctrine that, actually may contradict what it says somewhere else. And so how do we how do we harmonize these and understand them in light of each other? Right? All right. That's important. And I would I would like to say that I I would suggest that if if a person is a new believer not to get a Bible software right away. Hmm. Simply because I think you can get overwhelmed with all the information that it can just shove in your face all at once and you just don't know what to do with it. 
for yeah, uh, absolutely. That's why I brought these. These are the OG resources. It's like <laughs> this is my first Bible. If you look at it, I got tabs in it because I didn't know where all the books were. I would go yeah. to a Bible study and be like, turn to, you know, Jonah, <laughs> and I'm like, where's Jonah? Like I don't know where that is. And so I was always kind of not embarrassed by it, but I'm like, I need to learn where the books of the Bible. Yeah. So that was another thing I did. I memorized yeah. all 66 books in order. And I bought these tabs that helped me flip there quickly. So I wasn't like yeah. thumbing around <laughs> oh, or yeah. going to the table of contents. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but in here, man, you, you highlight, you underline, um, you just, you start digging around and it's just, a, yeah. it's a cool thing. Now I know I am backtracking a little bit. Would you suggest like a quest study Bible for a new believer? Yeah. You know, ESV study Bible is what I use now. That's what I tell people to get. Yeah. Um, that's my favorite one. Quest was helpful for me at that time. Yeah. Um, I think it's a, it was a good, helpful resource. Um, but I have adopted, I don't know if, I haven't seen too many of those. And, right. I, and I specifically haven't seen any like in the ESV. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was a good, it was a great Bible for me. I wanted to read all the different translations. So I started NIV. I think the next one I read was NASB. Okay. And then I read the ESV after that. And right. so I, I started kind of bouncing around translations, different translation philosophies, which is what you guys kind of get in, got into yeah. last week. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I would, like we talked about last week, the NIV or an ESV, something like that to start with, because I, when you start trying to, trying to open up a King James version for the first time and that you've never read the Bible before. Yeah. It, it's a, it's a, it can, it can really kind of be a task yeah. to try and figure out old English. So, yeah. but Hey, if that's what you got, read it. I th oh, yeah. The best, the best Bible translation is the one that you yeah. read. <laughs> <laughs> right. It really is. I mean, and I, I'm a, words matter to me. So like, I'm, hmm. I think translation philosophy matters. Um, but starting out, you know, if, I, if you have a, a, a translation that's King James, read that, you know, if you, if you can't afford to buy another one or someone to give you a Bible, whatever it is, I, yeah. I, I think just the importance of establishing the daily practice of reading yeah. the word is, is far supersedes. People used to learn how to read English studying the King James. Yeah. Yeah. That was how they learned how to read. Yeah. And so that there's a reason that was it's held so dear to, to so many people. But yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so to, to, to kind of, to cover what we've covered so far, you're saying, just get in a habit of reading the Bible first. And then once you have the, the habit established, then get into your studies then yeah, studying so the, the scripture. I forgot to say the fourth P. I think I said, okay. <laughs> I, said I got four P's for you, <laughs> but I think I left one out and that's just prayer. Like yeah. before, before I open the Bible, I want to pray that God would give me eyes to see in his word, that he would, that he would satisfy me in his word. If you read Psalm 119, it's it's an ode to God's word where David is is saying that very thing. Open my eyes, may that so that I may see wondrous things in your law. Right? I want to see that. I want to enjoy it. I don't want it just to be a textbook to study. Right. I don't want it to just be this boring thing. And there's days where I, I honestly I just I read it because it's a practice so that I have. But I think that daily discipline matters. I don't I don't always have these eye opening moments. Right. Um, but I do pray for that. So I, you you pray. You have a plan. You have a place, and then you're punctual on your timing. Do it daily, consistently. Yep. Those four things to get started. Okay. So yep. So you you're reading, and then you start getting into a deeper study with like the vines and and a concordance. Yeah. And then after that, you start getting into systematic theology. Is there anywhere else that you would want to go after that? That's that's the Steve Roby plan. You that's know? the Steve Roby plan. <laughs> when I, I think after systematic theology, you know. I use Bible software now primarily for sermon preparation just right. because it, it expedites the amount of time that it takes to, because I have shelves of commentaries now too. And I don't even, I don't really recommend commentaries early on because a lot of commentaries are written by textual critics, people who, hmm. if you really dig into what, they don't even really believe the Bible. Yeah. Um, some commentaries don't, but it's still good to look at, you know, what textual issues that they're bringing up in. Um, there are some great commentaries out there. I think it's important when you start getting into commentaries, if you do, to know, you know, sort of the theological framework, know, know as much as you can about the publisher of those. But I got shelves of commentaries, and it's just instead of, you know, bringing 12 books to the table now to sermon prep, I do it through Logos. Right. Right. And that, that is one thing that uh, uh, Logos is a good software, even the, the, the version that I have, which is, I think it was like the $49 version of Logos. And when you get into something like that, you're digging into 
a whole lot more. <laughs> yeah, thousands of books. I got yeah. so yeah, in my library. It has all the Greek. So uh, there's other word studies that I have. Once I took Greek, I studied Greek for a couple of years in seminary. That I have different, like advanced word studies. But I think this is the this is the key to getting started. I learned so much in these early years because oh, yeah. my it, learning curve was so big, yeah. like not knowing anything and to if, getting into. The and word. if you're thinking about picking stuff up, I, I'm, those are relatively inexpensive now mm-hmm. uh, online. If you on Amazon and places like that, if you find, you know, the vines and stuff, they're not that expensive. Yeah. So and there's something about thumbing through the books, yeah. right? Like having <laughs> now I mentioned like having all the commentaries, but like just having these three out. I can remember sitting at my dining room table in Germany as a young, you know, enlisted soldier, and like just being fascinated by studying different words in the Bible and making these connections and open up the Bible to this verse and then looking at this word and then tracing all these out and like it, it became an exploration. Like it really became like this enjoyable thing where. You know, if if you take it as Second Timothy says, right, as training in righteousness, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, "Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for yeah. righteousness." That, and that hunger, you know, that appetite was fed, and and drove my appetite for the Word because that's where the training in righteousness comes from. He says, "You'll be satisfied," you know. And yeah. so, like, Bible study doesn't have to be, you know, this laborious thing. Um, it can be very exciting. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, especially when you when you get to a point to where you're really excited about learning, and that's I think that's the thing that we have to always remember is that we should be excited to to learn anything. And you know, and that it, that applies to a lot of things in life, not just this, but but especially for this. You know, I mean, this is this is the creator of the universe yeah. that we're learning about. You know, and and he's seeking worshipers to worship him in spirit and in truth. And right. that truth is revealed in His Word, so we it helps us to know God better, so we can worship Him <laughs> rightly. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, I love it. Yeah. All right, I think that is an absolutely great place yeah. to uh, end on. Yeah, it's perfect. And, uh, oh yeah, and Steve, thank you for joining us for this. This has been a great conversation. It's good stuff. Yep. All right, everybody. If you have not done so, make sure you click that like button, the subscribe button, and ding that bell. So that way you know when we release new videos. If you're listening to this on a podcast, make sure you subscribe. If you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts, make sure you leave a review. We love you all, and God bless. I don't know how he does that. I know. He makes it look so easy. I (laughs) I jack it up every time. I'm sitting here trying to like say it before he says it. I quit trying. (laughs) I used to try it at the end of coffee time. Like whatever Rodney says. (laughs) I'm saying it in my mind as he's doing it. I I can't do it. Again, guys, thank you for joining us. We do love you all. Make sure you like, subscribe, and click that bell if you're watching this on YouTube. And if you're listening to this on Apple Podcast, make sure that you leave us a review. We do want to know how we're doing. We love you all, and God bless.